today is part two of our series, Everything Under the Sun. And if you missed last week, what we're talking about in this series is the meaning of life from the perspective of a man named Solomon. He wrote a book of the Bible 2,900 years ago. We call it Ecclesiastes. And the reason why I'm preaching it is because I turned 40 years old this month and I've been totally bummed out. And I thought, well, I know, I'll just make everyone feel bummed out with me. That's cheaper than therapy because counselors cost a lot of money these days. So today we're in part two of the book of Ecclesiastes, and it is a challenging piece of literature to read and apply to our lives. A part of it is because the structure of it kind of wanders and flows a little bit, but it is about life, and life is like that a lot of times. It doesn't always work out like an algebra problem, and it's written to reflect that. But the greater reason why it's a challenge, particularly for those of you who are Christians, uh, for those of us who believe the Bible is God's Word, is because it does not sound like it belongs in the Bible. And the reason why it sounds that way is because Solomon wrote this piece of literature from the perspective of a practical secularist. Someone who, like John Lennon, imagine there's no heaven, it's easy if you try. Maybe there is a God, maybe there isn't a God, who really knows, we're too busy to find out anyway, and in the end, I'm sure we just all die, and that's pretty much it. And he approaches the piece of literature, and his perspective is entirely, or he's, he's writing entirely from that perspective, and he's trying to figure out the answer to this question from that perspective on what is the meaning of life. And, and if you missed last week, it was a totally fun time, because here's the conclusion he reached. Life is meaningless under the sun. Okay, well, everything we have in this world, everything we live for, and then when you die, that's it. If, if that's your approach to life, you need to know that life under the sun is absolutely meaningless. His conclusion is that meaning is found beyond the sun. If you want to live a life with meaning, with purpose, with significance, with joy, with contentment, you're going to have to look beyond the context of birth to death. You're going to have to look beyond the context of under the sun. You're going to have to look beyond under the sun to God who made us. That's his conclusion. Now today, he's going to begin his tedious work of showing us how he arrived at this destination. Now when I was in high school, perhaps my least favorite subject in high school was math. I still remember my junior year, uh, Mrs. Stern, who wasn't nearly as mean as her name would suggest, always insisted that on every homework assignment we showed all the steps we took to reach the right answer. She did not care if you wrote down the right answer. She insisted that you had to demonstrate the steps you took to get to the right answer which of course I hated, it was too tedious, and I couldn't cheat that way if I had to show my work on how I got to that right answer. So I argued rather unsuccessfully that, oh, it's easy to show my steps. I push on on the scientific calculator, I punch in the equation, and look, here's the right answer, just like that. Well, she took away my calculator, and I went into theology. So it worked out for everybody in the end. But I realize in hindsight now that clearly Mrs. Stern was a Christian who loved the book of Ecclesiastes because now that Solomon has given us his answer, his conclusion to the matter, he is be going to begin the tedious process of showing his work. He didn't just roll out of bed one day and say, I think life is meaningless, I'm in a bad mood. No, he went to extensive lengths to figure out the meaning of life. I mentioned last week in his little research project, he was both researcher and guinea pig at the same time. He was the subject and the author of the research project, and he went to great lengths. Now at the end of chapter 1, in the beginning of chapter 2, he begins to show his work. How did he reach the answer? What were the steps he took to reach the conclusion that life under the sun is meaningless? So we're going to pick it up where we left off last week. We had a ray of hope last week. The ray of hope he gave in chapter 3 was that God has set eternity in our hearts. That we would know intuitively that this is true. But he says, but there's so much hanging in the balance we need to prove our work. So he gets to work with that. Uh, we read most of chapter 1 last week. We're going to pick it up at verse 14. We're going to read chapter 1 and 2 this week. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Solomon, you know you can't catch the wind, right? That's right. You're just chasing it. It's meaningless. He says, and here's why. And this is his theme for the entire next chapter. So this is an important verse to get. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted, he says. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone else who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much 
of wisdom and knowledge. So, so let me unpack everything that he's saying here. The problem with life as I see it is that it's hopelessly crooked. There is something wrong with our world where everything about it just isn't the way it ought to be. Everything about it is somehow crooked. It's not straight. It's not the way things should be. Now, everyone, I think, who even has remotely a conscience knows that this is true about the world that we live in today. We look at the world we live in and say, it's, it's just not the way it ought to be. It's not the way it should be. Our, our world just seems crooked, and, and there seems to be no good way of straightening this problem out. No matter how many elections we hold, no matter how many dollars we spend, no matter how many protests we have, no matter how many organizations we start, no matter how many wars that we fight, no matter how many charities we begin, the world remains hopelessly crooked. Not only that, Solomon says there's something lacking in our lives. We can't count it. We don't know exactly what, our, what it is. We can't quite put our finger on it, but, but we intuitively sense that something is incomplete in our lives. There's a sense of restlessness about us. There, there's a sense that something isn't the way it should be inside of me. So we're all on this quest to straighten out what's broken in our world and to find what's lacking in my life and to fill it. And what he says in this verse is, I've increased in wisdom more than anyone in Jerusalem before me. He's a humble guy. He's saying, I'm a smart guy. I know just the person who can figure out this problem. Me. I can figure this out. I, I can get a handle on straightening out this crooked world. I can figure out what's missing because I'm, I'm a pretty smart guy. And I'm sure if I research enough, if I study enough, I've, I've got a lot of resources. I can figure out what's wrong with our broken world. Now he begins his quest to do that. Here's what he says. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom, and also madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. So he says the first way he tries to figure out how to straighten out our crooked world and how to figure out what's lacking in our lives is through these two ways. He's going to try wisdom and knowledge. That's how he's going to try and figure out what's lacking in our broken world. Today we might say philosophy and science or philosophy and knowledge or knowledge and science, but maybe if we figure out the right answers, we can straighten out what's crooked. Now, here's the question for you today. We've had 2,900 years since the day of Solomon to learn and to grow and to figure and to apply. How are we doing with straightening out our crooked world that we live in? Did, did we get a handle on it yet? Is our world finally straightened out after learning enough things and discovering enough science and inventing new technologies? Or did Solomon tell the truth where he said the more he learned, the more grief increased in his life? The more he discovered, the more he realized how futile this actually is as an avenue to straighten out what's crooked in the world. Hey, guess what? We cured malaria. Hooray! The bad news? Well, we can't seem to actually treat everyone who has it and eradicate it. Oh no, by the way, while we're still working on this, here's the Zika virus. Good luck with that. We have penicillin. Hooray! Oh, now we have bacteria that we can't even treat at all with any penicillins. Oh. We have the internet. The whole world is connected. This is going to make things better. Oh, now terrorists use it to better coordinate their attacks on innocent civilians, and all the evil people in the world now have access to your child in their bedroom, whether they're in high school, middle school, or elementary school on their handheld device. Tell me something. Is science, is technology, is knowledge, is wisdom straightening out what's crooked in our world? This is important for us in the Western world. We as Westerners believe that enough research, enough knowledge, enough science will fix what's broken. Solomon warned us, it will increase your grief. It won't straighten out what is crooked. It won't fix what is lacking. Now, what he does next is amazing because he predicts the entire narrative arc of Western culture. He says, okay, science, knowledge, wisdom, that's not going to straighten out what's crooked? Well, then I'm just going to have a good time. Here's what he says next. I said to myself, come now, that didn't work. I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. So isn't this what we do? You're having a bad day, you're bummed out, you're filled with grief like Solomon was. What do you do? Eat some ice cream, 
go shopping, kiss a girl, go out for the weekend, go to Vegas, have a great time, whatever it is. We, we use pleasure as a way to find meaning, fulfillment, and straighten out what's crooked in our life when science and technology and knowledge don't work. So he says, I'm going to try that route. I'm going to go for pleasure to see if that it fills what's lacking inside of me. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guided by wisdom, or guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. So the next avenue he takes, laughter and pleasure. I'm going to try laughter and I'm going to try pleasure. Now, the Hebrew words that we translate into laughter and pleasure have a little more nuance than our English words suggest. Laughter carries the nuance of losing discernment. You know, going crazy, going nuts, drinking 12 bush lights while you're Netflixing and chilling. All right, that's, that's what laughter is. Pleasure is more refined aesthetic beauty. It's going to the theater, driving luxury cars. His conclusion getting wasted at 3 a.m. or driving your Mercedes, same thing. Jerry Springer, Dr. Phil, same thing, doesn't matter. Neither one of them are going to get you to the meaning that you are looking for in life. So he said, so I looked around and what do people do? They drink wine, they're looking for meaning in life. In the bottom of a bottle, they're trying to straighten out life by looking at the bottom of the bottle. So he said, I started drinking wine. Was it red wine? Was it white wine? I don't know, but it was Solomon, so I bet it wasn't out of a box. It was better than that stuff you drink. In fact, in 1 Kings, we're told that all of Solomon's wine goblets were made out of solid gold. That's how rich this guy was. Not 14 karat gold. Solid gold. Solomon is a living, breathing rap video, okay? He's got hundreds of beautiful women around him all the time. He's drinking wine out of goblets made of solid gold. He is throwing himself into pleasure, but he said something interesting. In all of this, my wisdom stayed with me. Did you catch that? What he's saying is, even while I was pursuing this, wisdom was informing me, when you get to the end of this road, it's still going to be crooked and there's still going to be something lacking and you won't have found it yet. So, he did what teenagers do. He turned the earbuds up to 10. Verse 4, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself. Now, when, the, when he says houses, he's not talking about a 1,700 square foot ranch, okay? This is Solomon. He builds palaces for himself. His main palace took 13 years to construct. And he said, that's not enough. I built houses. I built palaces. He took up architecture and planted vineyards. Okay, you, okay, we think Napa Valley is great. Solomon said, I'm going to have my own personal Napa Valley for me. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I'm got, I've got my own gardens. I'm, I'm going to become a horticulturalist, a botanist. I'm, I'm just going to have my own paradise, my own Garden of Eden. And it's not even a public park. It's not a state park. It's not a national park. It's my park for me. That's not all. I made reservoirs of water groves for, of, uh, to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. We find in other scriptures Solomon had about 20,000 personal attendants in his palaces to meet the needs of all of everything he was pursuing. In fact, we're even told the daily rations of food that it took to feed everyone under Solomon's employment. It's more food than your family will eat in a lifetime. That's what they ate every single day, he continues. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. We're also told in the Scriptures that Solomon made Jerusalem so wealthy that silver became worthless. Okay, so, Some of you has, have like the jar full of pennies because they really have no value, but you just collect them for some reason. During the reign of Solomon, he was so wealthy, he made Jerusalem so wealthy, people were like, oh, another ounce of silver? Yeah, just throw it in the jar. You know why? I don't know why I collect them. I just do. It's just silver. Every silverware? Nope. Too common. I want goldware. Gold forks, gold plates, gold goblets for my awesome wine while I can enjoy my palaces, my parks, my gardens, 
my lifestyle. Continues. I acquired male and female singers. He had his own theater company. Okay? You, you go, if you go to the theater or the opera or the concert, you got to buy your ticket and you got to sit in there with hundreds, maybe thousands of other people. There's one seat in the audience. It's for Solomon. I've got my own theater company. They play the shows I want them to play when I want them to play them. That's what I have. And a harem as well, if you don't know what that is, the delights of a man's heart, he says. Very subtle, Solomon, very nice. I became greater, a thousand women, by the way, literally 1,000 women in his harem. And, and his wives are all very attractive. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. Translation, isn't going to work. I am going to take this to the end of the rail. I'm going to go to the last stop on this path to see what pleasure brings me. To see what accomplishments and achievements bring me. But this nagging wise voice in my head says, it's not going to straighten what's crooked. It's not going to fill what's lacking. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor and this was the reward for all my toil. Now, when he says, I denied my eyes nothing they desired, 99.999999% of us cannot say that. We deny ourselves all kinds of things our eyes desire, don't we? We don't have the money, we don't have the influence, we don't have the power, we don't have the connections to take what our eyes desire, so we deny ourselves all kinds of things. Solomon is one of the point zero 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 one percent where, no, if he wants anything, it's his. He has the money, he has the connections, he has the influence, he has the strength. Whatever his eyes want, he can have. So, what's he pursuing meaning in? Pleasure, laughter, accomplishments, and accumulation. He is looking at all these avenues in order to fix what is crooked, in order to fill what is lacking in his life. Even though wisdom's nagging him, going to come up empty. Here's what he concluded. Verse 11, Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Here's what we think. We who are lower on the food chain than Solomon, we think that the reason why I haven't found what's lacking in my life yet the reason why I can't seem to straighten out what's crooked in my own life yet is be simply because I haven't had enough pleasure yet. I haven't had enough success yet. I haven't had enough accomplishments and I haven't had enough achievements yet. But if, if, I, if, if my wine was just a little nicer... If my car was just a little faster, if I had that house that's on the lake, okay, if, if, if I could be with someone a little bit more attractive, then I will have what's lacking in my life. Then everything messed up in my life, it's all going to get straightened out, and it's all going to get worked together. Solomon said, I've been to the end of that road. I made it to the last stop. And he reports the same thing that the elite in our society report. If you read the biographies or watch the documentaries of the point zero 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 one percent in the 20th century in America, and even in the 21st century, they're very unhappy. Because we can live under the veil and with the illusion that if I can just get a little bit further down the path of my success, of, what, of making my mark, of having a little more pleasure, then I will have what's lacking. But the people who actually have had the means to get to the end of that path got to the end and you know what they discovered? They weren't unhappy because they were rich. They weren't unhappy because they were successful. They were happy because they got to the end of the trail and they were still them. 
They were still them. It's not that the pleasure and the accomplishments and the success, it's not that they didn't bring the rush. It's not that they didn't bring the orgasm. It's not that they didn't bring accolades and envy from everyone else around them. It didn't bring transcendence. It didn't bring anything bigger than themselves. It didn't bring them an experience of anyone bigger than themselves. And as a result, they get to the end and there's emptiness and there's brokenness. And what is crooked remains crooked. And what is lacking still cannot be counted. And what Solomon is trying to teach us here is very simple. You can have a full house. You can have a full refrigerator. You can have a full liquor cabinet. You can have a full resume. You can have a full bed and still have emptiness in your life. In fact, here, here's this fill in the blank I want you guys to fill in. You can have a full... You fill in the blank. Come on. What, for you, what is it? What do you think? If, if, boy, if, if I know what's lacking in my life and when I get there, then I'm going to be satisfied. Then everything's going to be straightened out in my life. What, what do you think that is? Solomon, listen, and he's the point zero 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 one percent He got there. He had more money than you'll ever have, more women than you'll ever have, more bling than you'll ever have, more success than you'll ever have, more envy and accolades than you'll ever have. He had it all. What do you think it is? Because you can have a full fill in your blank and an empty soul. And no experience of transcendence. No experience of the eternal. No experience of sovereign God in your life. That's the conclusion that he reached. He continues. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom. And also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? In other words, he says, I made it to the end of the trail. I've, seriously, no one's ever going to do more than I've done. No one's ever going to amass more than I've done. I've taken that road to the end. That's not going to straighten out what's crooked. All right, let's then consider something different. New arena, wisdom and foolishness, madness and folly. He goes, I saw that wisdom is better than folly. Thanks, Einstein. Just as light is better than darkness, the wise have eyes in their heads while the fool walks in the darkness. But, but, I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless, for the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. So he says, all right, knowledge didn't get me there, pleasure didn't get me there, accomplishments didn't get me there. So let's think about wisdom and foolishness. Well, maybe I'll be the village idiot. They look happy. Yeah, I'll be the village idiot. And then he thought, well, no. That's not going to lead me clearly to anywhere good in life, but then the more he thought about it, but what difference does it even make? Come on, what, what? who cares if you're wise or foolish? You're going to die, same fate. It's going to meet both of you. So, so, so what does it matter, he suddenly realizes, how I live my life, what I accumulated, what I accomplished, if I'm going to die and then I'm going to be forgotten. Because I'm going to tell you something. Most of us, unlike Solomon, are not writing literature that is going to be talked about two millennia from today, okay? Most of us, by the time it's 20 years from your death, your memory will be gone. We will be forgotten. Maybe if there's an exceptionally talented person in the room or a remarkable person, maybe 100 years from now you'll be remembered. Maybe. But if all there is to this life is under the sun, if all there is to this life is the context of this life, then his point is, then who really cares if you were wise or foolish? Who really cares if you were naughty or nice? Who can really say what's good or evil? What did any of it matter? And that's the conclusion he wants us to wrestle with. He is eliminating the possibility of being an optimistic agnostic. And that's his point. How can you say that all there is to this life is this life and be an optimistic person? Think about it. If there is no God, and if the universe is here because a subatomic particle exploded into the known universe, 
and if the right spark hit the right pool of chemicals so that a single cell of life could emerge, and if, as it evolved, one peculiar species of fish seemed to grow this unuseful appendage until it turned into legs and crawled out onto land, and if a comet hit the earth killing all the dinosaurs so that Homo sapiens could emerge, if your origin is that insignificant, random, and chaotic, and... If, after you die at some point, another comet will hit the earth, or the sun will explode, or the universe will expand so far that everything cools off, and everybody dies, and there's no history, no memory, no humans, no nothing left, Solomon says, then can we admit, absolutely everything is insignificant. Absolutely everything is, who who cares what you accomplished? It's meaningless. Who cares if you made people feel good or feel bad? It's meaningless. It's all going to be eviscerated. And that's the point he's leading us to in our next fill in the blank. If your origin is insignificant and your destiny is insignificant, then admit that you are insignificant. He says, come on, be reasonable. Don't be naive. If, if, if you're going to take this approach that all there is to this life is this life, we're here in, uh, from insignificant cause and we have an insignificant future, then admit, you are an insignificant creature. That's the conclusion he's headed to. So here's what he says next. This is your new life verse. So I hated life. Let, let, let me tell you something. So... This whole turning 40 thing, it's, it's been on my radar for a while. I've, been, I've, I've known it's been coming up, right? So I have for months been trying to figure out a good midlife crisis to have, okay? And I even ask people, hey, do you have any recommendations on a good midlife crisis to have? And, and, and I've gotten lots of them. Yeah, go buy a Harley. Go to Vegas for a week. I've gotten all kinds of suggestions. And, and I've been thinking, okay, you know, that, that might be a good midlife crisis to have, or that one might be good. And then I've been studying Ecclesiastes at the same time. And it has ruined my midlife crisis. Everything I think about, I'm like, I don't even want to do that anymore. What does it matter? It's, it's meaningless. I hated life, said Solomon. I'm like, Whose idea was it to preach this book of the Bible when I'm turning 40? This is the dumbest thing. So I hated life, he said, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And, and who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish. Yet, they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. What he's saying is, whatever you're accomplishing at work, someone else is going to take over the division someday and everything you did won't matter. Or what more likely to happen, technology will advance and your entire industry won't matter. And then you're going to leave all your stuff to their kids and are they going to be wise and foolish? Oh no, which are they going to be? This is all meaningless, he says, as he's looking around at his kids. It's meaningless. It's chasing after the wind. So my heart began to what? You feeling bummed out yet? You should be. I read this to my kids. I said, kids, what do you think this means? I read it all. They said, that's awful. I I began to despair. What, What does it all matter? Over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a person may labor with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. Continues. What do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? Now at this point, some of you are pushing back. And what you're saying is, I don't know, maybe maybe he just needs some antidepressants or something. Maybe he's taking this a little bit too far because honestly, I think there's a lot of meaning in, in life. I think there's a lot of joy in life. I think there's a lot of satisfaction in life. When I go outside on a day like today and the sun is shining and, I, and it warms my body, that brings me pleasure. And, and, and you know, when I, when I go out on, on, on a boat ride on the lake or a motorcycle ride through the countryside, that, that brings me joy and life has meaning. Or, or when I hug someone I love, I think life has meaning. Solomon says, don't be so naive. My question is, what do you get for, what's the word? 
add it up. What do you get for all your toil under the sun? See, you wouldn't take a job unless you knew all of the benefits and compensation for the job. You wouldn't interview for a job and they say, hey, we're giving you this role, you want it? You say, well, you haven't talked about compensation yet. And they say, well, we have casual Fridays. Oh, I hate wearing ties. Sign me up for that job. Casual Friday sounds great. Sure, casual Friday is great, but... You would never take a job unless you understood what you were getting for all your toil and labor. Solomon says, why would you be logical in every other area of your life and suddenly be a fool when you look at the totality of your life? Well, I have casual Friday. Oh, I like the boat ride around the lake. Oh, I love getting hugs. Fine. What are you getting for all? Add it up. Total it up. What's the entire compensation for your life? What are the entire benefits? What's the meaning of your entire life on this earth? For all your anxious striving. For everything which you labor under the sun. All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. You ever have a hard time sleeping? Solomon says, why would you have a hard time sleeping? This is really easy because your day tomorrow at work is going to be grief or pain. Okay, no mystery there. Get a good night's sleep. What's tomorrow going to be like? Well, it's either going to be grief or it's going to be pain. It might be both. Oh, okay. Well, I'm out for the night then. He says, it's going to be grief or pain. It, it's meaningless, he continues. A person can do nothing better. Now, 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 hold, hold on. This is the first ray of hope in the book, okay? And you've been sitting, especially if you are here last week, you've been sitting through a lot of meaninglessness. So, so pay attention. This is the first place where God is introduced into the book and suddenly the gray clouds part and a beam of light comes through. It's, I mean, it's an Ecclesiastes beam of light, so it's not like radiant, but something's coming through the clouds nonetheless. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God, for without Him, who can eat or find enjoyment. Now, when I got to this verse, I suddenly realized what my midlife crisis should be. I call it meat week. Salmon, filet, shrimp, meat week. Why? It's biblical. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. Gentlemen, brilliant or not brilliant, every night on the grill, meat week. You're welcome. That's why we love Jesus at Hope. He's full of wisdom and good things. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction. Now this is key. Where? In their own toil. Now next week, come back next week because we're going to start to unpack that next week. Satisfaction under the sun is not found in pleasure, accomplishments, or achievements, but in doing what God designed you to do and taking satisfaction in the labor that you do. But here's what's interesting for our eyes and attention this morning. He said, this too I see is from the hand of God. Here's the question. That means, in addition to being able to find satisfaction in your work, something else is a gift from God that he's been talking about. What is the something else that he has been talking about which is a gift from God? Because all he's been talking about is how meaningless life is. And that is the answer. The other thing that is a gift from God that he has been speaking about is you with an overwhelming sense of despair at the meaninglessness of life under the sun. That is a gift from God. God who set eternity in your heart wants you to be painfully aware that under the sun what is crooked will not be straightened out. That under the sun what is lacking will not be supplied because that would mean there is someone who is put enough together, someone who is not crooked, who can come in and straighten out this crooked world. But the reality is, we're part of the crooked world problem. 
Look at the dysfunction you cause in your life, in your family. Look at the hurt you do to the people in your life that you love the most. We are crooked people. We are perpetuating a crooked world. Okay? And we are needy, lacking people. We are not supplying what is lacking in the world. Solomon said, maybe I'm the one who can straighten things out because I'm a wise person. I'm a smart guy. I can provide what is lacking because I have a lot of resources. Solomon reached the conclusion, I am unable to straighten out this crooked world. I am unable to supply what is lacking. Who can do this? He said, but you need to know that the despair, the depression, the frustration you feel in a crooked world is the gift from the hand of God. You should not have hope that anything crooked can straighten out this world, but only perfection could. Continues. Life will be meaningless until you see that all of the pleasure, all of the accomplishments, the beauty and the satisfaction you crave can be gained in Jesus. Jesus did not come from under the sun. Jesus came from beyond the sun. He came from heaven and lived in this world without sin. He alone was not crooked. He alone was not lacking. And he looked at the crookedness, the brokenness, the the lacking around him, and he did something about it. Why is it a blessing to be hopelessly frustrated with the world that we live in? You need to look to Jesus to answer that question. Why was Jesus always attracted to the people who were the lowest of the low on the moral ladder while the religious elites got his harshest criticism and judgment? Why is it that when a woman is caught in the act of adultery, Jesus does not condemn her? Why is Jesus saying that it is not the healthy who need the doctor but the sick? Because it is only the person with a crooked back who needs the chiropractor. And it is only those of us who realize that we cannot straighten out what is crooked and fill what is lacking are looking up to Him to fix that world for us, to fill our need for us. And that's what He did. Isaiah the prophet tells us that Jesus had no beauty in Him that we should be attracted to Him. He gave up His beauty. He gave up His pleasure to come to this world to live in your place, to die for your sin, to rise on the third day, to restore you and redeem you and give you a place in heaven with Him, to forgive what is crooked in your own life, to promise you a future resurrection into eternity where everything, where everything is ironed out where nothing is crooked, where everything is supplied, where as the psalm writer said, God, you will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasure at your right hand. The world's broken. It's crooked. It's lacking. And no crooked or lacking person is going to fix that. Jesus did. It was not Solomon who had the wisdom and the smarts and the accomplishment to do us. It was the descendant of Solomon, the true and greater Solomon who sat on that throne, Jesus, King Jesus, who can supply what's lacking. Now, this is where God is finally introduced in the book of Ecclesiastes. And it begins kind of a high point in chapters 3 and 4. We're going to skip chapter 3 next week. You can read that at home on your own. We're going to get into chapter 4 next week. But we're going to begin to say, now that we know this is true, now that the reader, Solomon hopes, is giving up hope of finding meaning just in the context of under the sun, we begin to learn how to live lives that are filled with joy and purpose and satisfaction while we live out our days under the sun because Jesus is going to be with you and Jesus will take you to a better home beyond the sun. And we'll pick it up there next week. Let me pray for you guys. Father in heaven, thank you for this incredible incredible wisdom that you preserved for us to read this morning. Forgive us for being foolish, thinking that we can straighten out our lives if we only gain more, if we have more pleasure, more success, more accomplishments, that somehow everything lacking will be fulfilled. Jesus, only you can fill us. Jesus, only you can straighten out everything that's broken in our lives. Thank you for Those of us who've been feeling despair in these two weeks, thank you. That's a gift from you. That's wisdom from you to look beyond under the sun and to look to you to be our hope.
and our salvation. Wherever this lands for us, give us the wisdom not to pursue what however we fill in the blank, but to pursue you. Jesus, you are a pleasure. You are a joy. You accomplished all this for us. So give us the wisdom to apply this in our lives. I ask this in your name. Amen.